coming up next hour. He's Bob Costas, the award-winning uh, broadcaster from NBC Sports, Major League Baseball Network. Let me start football, Bob, and the commissioner. How do you view the commissioner, or how do you think the commissioner is viewed now after what happened with the replacement officials? Well, smack in the middle of it, and that's what's uppermost in people's minds. I saw a poll uh, in this morning's USA Today, which commissioner do you dislike most? And Goodell was in the lead at 38%, and Bettman and Stern were just about tied at 20 or 21%, and then Selig is at 16%. Now, if that poll was taken in 1994 or 1995, <laughs> you know, Selig would be at the top of the list, but there's plenty of distance between him and losing a World Series, and people aren't thinking in terms of baseball issues you know, as much. So I think Goodell will get past this. I think he's done a lot of things right during his tenure. Uh, obviously, he's a businessman and obviously has to answer to the owners, but I do think that he's a person who actually cares about the game beyond business, cares about the health and safety of the players, and generally speaking, is trying to do the right thing while also balancing the business aspects. We've looked at Commissioner Stern after Jordan retired and trying to bring the league back. We looked at baseball, that baseball came back eventually. Can the NFL, can this uh, game plan formula be screwed up? They can get past this pretty easily. Um, you'll hear about it again if the Packers, let's say, miss the playoffs by a game or if that loss is the difference between having home field and a first-round bye for them. You'll hear about it again. But pretty soon people will forget. You know, you, we both remember when they put replacement players on the field yeah. and the results of those games counted toward who made the Super Bowl that year. And it didn't prevent people from watching that year's Super Bowl or considering that year's Super Bowl champions to be legitimate champions. They'll get past that. The thing that football faces, even with its through-the-roof ratings and even with it being the, not just the sports juggernaut but the pop culture juggernaut that it is, the big issue, and Goodell knows it, is there's a fundamental problem with the game that's been exposed, and that is that it's more than just dangerous to the body. We've all seen middle-aged and older NFL players who can barely get out of bed or who come limp limping into a room. But now we know in documented fashion about uh, the, the brain trauma. And the question is, well, you can make it a little bit safer, and they're trying. Can you really fundamentally alter the game um, without changing the way it's played and making it less popular? That's really the big issue that they face. Well, you also had them wanting to add two more games, and I said you, you, you can't do both. You, you can't add two more games and, and talk about player safety. It's just the odds, I mean, right. the attrition. You're, you, you're just, and also another thing is the more successful you are in the NFL, the more likelihood you end up with permanent damage or some kind of damage the longer you stay in the game. Yep, the longer you stay in the game, and as we now know, it isn't just the hits that result in diagnosed concussions. All those sub-concussive hits take a cumulative toll. And the big problem I think they face, you're starting to see some of these, um, these spots during games. Uh, I think it's called heads up, but I could be wrong. Uh, talking about ways that youth coaches can learn to make the game safer. The league knows it has a problem coming with this generation and the next where some parents are going to say, look, I'm a lifelong football fan. I can't in good conscience let my kid play this game now that I know what I know about it. So that's, that's a much bigger problem long-term than the replacement refs. They'll put this behind them pretty quickly. Yeah, that, John Lynch was with us a couple of days ago, and he talked about his league with his 13-year-old. Uh, they went from eight teams to four teams because you have parents who are now taking their kids out of football, and mm -hmm. maybe we don't see something in the next five years or ten years, but it might be in 15 or 20 years that will see these numbers uh, affect uh, football. We're talking to Bob Costas from NBC Sports. Did want to talk to you about baseball and, and the extra wild card. And I know we talked about when we brought the first wild card in. Now you got the second one. And the only thing I get concerned out about is if, if you, you get into the postseason, usually you've struggled for the last month to get in. And we usually see those teams in playoff mode already. It's the team that's been great for six months they run into this team that's hot, and then, then they get bounced. So I'm always worried about how fair is the, you know, is it a level playing field with this extra wild card that we're going to have in here? Well, I think that Bud Selig would tell you that overall it's worked because so many teams uh, remain alive. And even if a few dropped out in the last week, there were even more that were alive into September. So that increases interest. That's a good thing. But here's what I would do. And I think most players would agree with this. 
It's one thing if teams finish in a dead heat after 162 and then you play one game, because that's just like an extra inning or an overtime period because you've had a 162-game race. But if you have two wild cards and one finishes substantially ahead of the other and they're from different divisions, and then you just play a scheduled one-game knockout, there's something weird about that. This isn't football. It's baseball. I think what they should do, and maybe they'd have to shorten the season to 158 games to do this, and big deal, each team would lose two home games at the gate. And for some of those teams, they're just meaningless end-of-year games that aren't going to be well-attended anyway. And in return, what I'm about to suggest would bring them more television revenue. Make the first round, the, the wild card round, two out of three, but play all three games, if necessary, on the home field of the wild card team with a better record. So now you're further penalizing the team that just barely made it in through the back door. Then the winner of that series goes immediately with no day off to the home field of the team with the best record. And instead of 2-2-1, you play 3-2. So you're not really making the team that had the best record wait around that long. And they'll play the first three games at home. It's possible that the wild card team would never play a single home game if they get swept. And they'd never even get to having 40% of the home games in that round on their home field unless and until they forced a fifth game. So there you would further advantage the team to finish first. You'd make the first round, the wild card knockout round, more legitimate. You'd generate more television revenue. And you wouldn't really stretch the schedule out that much. I like that. I do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Vote for me. Thanks. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'm, um, I'm not a sabermetrics guy. Um, mm-hmm. I tend to watch the game, enjoy the game. I don't need to crunch numbers to look ins- at somebody and look at their validity. Um, it's just hard for me to look at Miguel Cabrera if he wins the Triple Crown, no matter what Mike Trout does, and not give it to somebody who is winning a Triple Crown. I Is that... You know, should I open my eyes and, you know, jump into the 21st century here, or you uh, follow my, uh, my logic here? I, I do follow it. I think that the voters may snap the tie based on who makes the playoffs. If the Tigers win the division, even though they haven't had a great season, and the Angels don't grab that last wild card, that'll make it an easier decision. If it goes the other way, if the Angels get into the playoffs uh, and the Tigers don't, then that'll be the tiebreaker in the minds of some of the voters. But... Let's say they both get into the postseason. Mm-hmm. Now, who are you voting for? Let's well, say let's say Cabrera goes triple crown, mm-hmm. and you got Mike Trout with his numbers. Both have made the postseason. Yep. Well, again, you could vote for Trout on on the basis that he's a much better defender and he's a much better base runner than Cabrera. So yep. he has those things going for him, and he's close enough uh, in the hitting statistics. That's yeah, hard, though. It's a triple it is crown. Hard. Bob. It's pretty tough. Uh, you know, though, that Ted Williams won two triple crowns without being voted the MVP that year. Yeah, but nobody Lou, liked him. Yeah, well, they were idiots. Yeah. And, and yeah. Lou, Lou Gehrig, who everybody liked, won a triple crown, and they gave it to <laughs> Mickey Cochran. <laughs> if you were no buying, figure. if Harper and Trout were stocks, I've asked this before, who would you invest in? You have to say Trout. But, you know, if Trout was already off the board and I had to settle for Harper, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be unhappy about it. <laughs> and I think when you hear those comparisons, and I know what Mickey Mantle means to you, but, you know, for this generation to understand the pressure, if you're going to say Trout and Harper remind you of mm-hmm. Mickey Mantle, couldn't we have picked somebody maybe a little lower on the totem pole here? <laughs> you know what I think a lot of younger fans don't realize, because they look at the numbers. And while Mantle's numbers are impressive, especially post-steroid era, a lot of guys have gone past those raw numbers. I don't think that many people appreciate just how good Mantle was for the first 10 years of his career, even, even with the injuries that were beginning to take a toll on him. When you look at his slugging percentages, his on-base percentages, his home runs per time at bat in a ballpark that was cavernous and really wasn't favorable to him, uh, Bill James would tell you that he was, for that stretch of time, the greatest offensive force in all of baseball. Plus, he could run like crazy. He might have been the fastest man in baseball. The combination of natural speed and natural power was something that baseball men had never seen before. Of course, he was not as good a, a, a center fielder as, as Willie Mays, not remotely as good. But for the first 10 years, 12 years of their careers, Mantle and Mays were pretty, pretty much on, an, on equal footing. That's how good Mantle was. Yeah, I just think, and, and I'm trying to think of this. Paulie asked me the other day, who was the best player I saw at a young age? Now, I, I, re- I remember Al Kaline, but not vividly. Dwight mm-hmm. Gooden is uh, somebody that, you know, was must-see TV. 
Uh, Griffey, you know, in in you know, knowing him in Cincinnati and his father, uh, probably him at the earliest age, you know, eighteen or nineteen, you realized just how special. Who was the guy who stood out to you? I choose Griffey, and I don't remember Mays and Mantle at the very beginnings of their careers. Mays is the best all-round player I've ever seen. Um, Griffey was at a young age, I think, not only a great player, but so so wonderful and beautiful to watch. I think I'd go with him. Good to visit with you again, Bob. Okay, Dan, take care. All right, see, you, see you Sunday. All right, Bob Costas, he'll be in uh, Philadelphia, Giants-Eagles uh, Sunday night.